Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, thank you to Eco America for inviting me to be part of the day. I've always admired uh, everything the organization does to kind of raise awareness and help people understand the climate challenge. Um, my job in the world is to work with mostly large companies. I help them navigate and understand the world's megatrends, you know, in particular climate change, and help them build companies that serve the world, that solve the world's problems instead of causing them. Um, and I've worked in this intersection of business and society for about 20 years. There's been more change in the last couple of years, um, not just the pandemic, but just so many things that we're building, more change in what it means to be a business and what's expected of companies in the last couple of years than in the 20 that I've, I've been in this. You know, businesses used to focus pretty much entirely on profit in the short term, and they mostly stayed out of societal issues. They, they kind of acted like it wasn't their role. Um, and that's just not true anymore. I mean, they're still overly focused on profit, but they have a deep stake now in solving big problems. And really all the large companies in the world are at the table at least and, and talking about climate. And there's this change in what's expected of business to have a position on for CEOs to take a stand on. You now see companies talking about how they are handling climate and inequality and LGBTQ rights and racial, racial justice and democracy and, and now how they'll work with or pull out of Russia. You know, Edelman, uh, the PR firm, does a survey every year of you know, citizens all over the world. And, and uh, last year's kind of, it's a trust survey. 86% of people said that they want CEOs to speak out. And all of us, all of you, kind of create that pressure as employees, as buyers of products from companies, um, as shareholders, it all creates pressure for companies to do more. You know, how did we get here? How are we having the kind of level of challenges that we are and how did climate get, get to be such a big problem? I think that the business community has played a pretty critical role in creating this problem, but it's partly because there's been this kind of story, this narrative that somehow we can have infinite growth and just keep growing and using more and more stuff on a finite planet. It's, it's just impossible. And every year, um, there's something called the Earth Overshoot Day, which some of you probably know, which is an estimate of what day did, in the year have we now used everything that the planet can provide in a given year, kind of the interest on the, on the natural capital. Last year, it was uh, July 29th. So every day after that, we were using resources from the future. We were robbing from our kids. So this idea that we can keep growing is one, one problematic story. And the other one that's related is that profit is the only measure of how a business does. GDP and the stock market are the only measures of, of how a country is doing or society. And it ignores well-being and long-term thriving. And so in this world where we kind of have the wrong story, everything's been accelerating, you know, almost exponentially. The amount of climate emissions have have accelerated exponentially since the Industrial Revolution. Um, the attack on biodiversity, the rise in inequality, the amount of money going up to the very, very top. And these issues are all related, right? The, the wealthiest people in the world create the most emissions while the poor face the consequences. So what's happening with climate? I'm sure you've heard a lot about this today, but we're seeing you know, radically more storms, floods, droughts, I saw an article a couple months ago interviewing firefighters in California, and they said, you know, it used to be that uh, if you saw a 100,000 acre fire, it would be kind of a once in career thing. And at the time of this article, they were fighting five of them, um, and there was a 1 million acre fire. So it's the scale of everything that's happening. If you saw in Antarctica, it was 70 degrees warmer, seven zero degrees warmer than normal. Um, that is beyond anything scientists really even thought was possible. So we're seeing this extreme pressure on the planet. In the last five decades, the populations of mammals and birds, amphibians and fish have dropped about 68%. We're causing a mass extinction event and it's dangerous, right? We're part of this web. We can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. It's impossible. And the costs of this, if we wanna get just kind of mercenary about it and just think in, in, in money terms, are enormous. The, the uh, insurance company Swiss Re has estimated that half of global GDP is at risk from uh, not having high functioning biodiversity. And, and arguably it's all GDP. 
And they say about 20% of the economy is at risk from climate if we don't do much. But that number kind of hides something that on average, it might be a 20% decline in, in the economy. And that seems, it's a that would be like a bad depression, but we could probably live through it. But it's not 20% everywhere. There's places that are becoming uninhabitable, cities that will be underwater. I, I grew up in, in South Florida. And when I talk to the scientists, I don't get a very good um, picture of what Miami is going to be like in, in 20, 30 years. I think it's going to be very hard to live there and potentially completely uninhabitable. There's cities in the Mideast and elsewhere that will be just too hot to live in many days of the year. You can't go outside. It can actually literally kill you. So this is where we're headed. And so for those parts of the world, it's not 18% or 20% loss in GDP. It's 100%. It's the whole economy. It's the whole world for that city in that region. And this stuff is costing companies in real terms, you know, billions of dollars from, from these floods and droughts affecting um, bottom lines. So this is part of the reason companies are at the table. So that would be pretty depressing to stop right there, but there is good news. The, this exponential change that we see in the world also applies to some of the solutions. So we've seen this unbelievable um, improvement in the economics of renewable energy. The uh, cost of building wind and solar is now basically lower than, than building gas, coal, nuclear in almost the entire world. So the battle over renewables versus fossil fuels is actually kind of over. About 90% of the new um, energy put on the grid over the last few years globally has been solar and wind. Um, it doesn't mean there's no coal plants. You know, China and India are still building some, but they're also ramping up renewables at an unbelievable pace, and they will shut down the coal. Um, so there's there's good news. And the the cost of battery storage for, for things like electric vehicles, way down. Um, and so those have become um, competitive, right? Buying an EV is now a normal price thing. You know, Tesla kind of made it sexy and put out pretty expensive cars, but now there's kind of regular cars. Uh, my family has a Kia, um, Nero, it's EV, it's great. Um, it's, it's one of those kind of simple things you can do um, to affect your footprint almost immediately. And we leased it. We, we had never leased a car, but said, you know, the, the technology is getting better and better. So we'll lease for a few years. And then when we get to the end of that, there'll probably be EVs with an even larger range. And it's an amazing car. And these cars are, I think, just frankly better to drive. They take almost no um, management. There's no, there's kind of no servicing of it. There's just not, there's not an engine, there's no oil. I mean, this is the kind of thing that day to day you can do. And auto companies are moving very quickly. Almost all the big auto companies have committed to selling only EVs by you know, 2035, 2040, and they're moving fast. So that's good news. There's also, in a way, good news that companies are feeling pressure from investors for the first time. Um, it's what's called uh, environment, social, and governance, or ESG, is what investors call it. That's the, the things they're asking companies about on how they're managing. The, the SEC, the, the governing body in the US on securities and stocks, just said last week that they're going to put out mandatory disclosure for public companies, meaning public companies are going to have to talk about their climate emissions and their risk from climate change. Um, businesses are pressuring each other. They're pressuring all their suppliers. Employees, I think, are probably the most powerful. You're seeing a rise of pressure from within companies, the tech giants like Amazon. There, was group, there were groups that got started amongst employees to put pressure on their management, on Jeff Bezos, to do more on climate. And it really kicked off that company in particular moving. And you're seeing it across many, many companies. So in a way, the, the employees are just being citizens in that case. And this is where you know, all of you can make a big difference. You, know, you make choices every day. You make choices in where you go work. Um, the younger crowd, the young millennials and Gen Z are very clearly making choices based on their values. They wanna to go to companies that they agree with, that they think have values that are on the right path. And this is really powerful. And we can do this every day through our buying, obviously. Um, there's more and more information about how companies are handling this. There's, um, there's a list online right now, um, put up by the Dean of the Yale Business School on the 400 or so companies that have announced what they're doing about Russia. And he's kind of ranked them and put them in five buckets of, you know, really pulling everything out of the 
out of the country down to actually making money off the war. And that kind of transparency is rising all the time. And we as consumers will get more information uh, in the coming years on every product. Uh, Unilever, one of the, the kind of great leaders in sustainability, is going to put carbon footprint information on 70,000 products. So it's going to get easier for us. Um, so we need companies to step up. We need to step up as individuals. Um, business can't thrive unless people and planet are thriving and, and, and we can't thrive in failing societies. So these issues are completely interrelated. We, we do live in scary times. We do, um, you know, we don't live in a funny time. We don't live in a light time. These are, these are tough. I have two teenagers and it's, it's kind of hard to tell them. They see it all. They, they know what's happening, but there is hope. And uh, we have solutions and we have pressure coming from young Americans and young global citizens and from all of you that are taking part in supporting this. And, and we have hope in um, organizations like Eco America. So I thank you for uh, giving me some time uh, and I throw it back to Megan. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and if you haven't uh, seen Andrew's book, um, it's on the shelves uh, today and it is, um, we'll put it in the chat for you. Um, so, and I don't know about you all, but I am getting on Greg's adventure scientist list to be one of the citizen scientists. That looks really fun. Um, and I'm also going to look, have another look at the brands I buy to ensure that they're working for climate solutions uh, rather than against them. So Andrew and Greg, you gave us a lot to think about and engage with, so thank you. And as we can see all around us, climate change is here and now. And we need to all do what we can to stop the pollution that is causing climate change while we still have a short window of time to do so. But we are already experiencing change and need to be sure to care for ourselves and the folks who are most vulnerable around us while we work to stop it. So here to talk about how we can prepare for climate change is author and CBS News correspondent, David Pogue, interviewed by Bob Perkowitz from Eco America. Welcome, David and Bob. Hi, I'm Deanna Cohen, co-founder and CEO of Plastic Pollution Coalition, where stopping the crisis of plastic pollution is a national priority. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and thought leaders in 75 countries working toward a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impact on humans, animals, waterways, the ocean, and the environment. We've pioneered awareness, messaging, and solutions to plastic pollution for 12 years. Whether you are an advocate, policymaker, business leader, student, or concerned individual, you can take action to stop plastic pollution. You can work with us towards a plastic pollution-free America and a plastic pollution-free planet. Visit us at PlasticPollutionCoalition.org to learn more, to support our work, and to join our global coalition. Thank you.
So a public health institute is founded on a number of different beliefs. One of those beliefs is that we believe that uh, better health policy can lead to a healthier country, to healthier Americans. Um, and we come to work each and every day at our respective institutes to do just that, to think about and implement best policy, best research, best practices in order to bring, to improve the lives of everyone who lives here in the United States. States. Public health institutes are nonprofit organizations that work with multi sector approaches to improve population health. Um, they're very important muscles. Um, I don't think of them as bricks and mortar, but they're muscles to build health and to create opportunities for all people to be healthy. When we looked at what birds were in trouble, we realized that grassland bird species were doing the worst. And if we wanted to save grassland bird species, we needed to go where they were. And this is where they are. We designed the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program to partner with the people that are stewarding the land. Birds can tell us a lot of things about the health of an ecosystem. And one of the reasons is, is that birds can fly. If they don't like an ecosystem, they're not gonna be utilizing that ecosystem. The symbiotic relationship between cattle and birds is significant because the way they graze provides the habitat that the birds utilize. The Audubon Conservation Ranching Program extends an interest of Julie's and mine to connect people in town in cities with people who are working on the land. We actually see grass-fed beef as a byproduct of our land stewardship. If we can preserve the open spaces that also maintain these businesses, that's a win-win for everybody. My name is Libby Porzig. I'm an ecologist, and I'm the director of the Working Lands Group at Point Blue Conservation Science. I think of rangelands as the heart of California. These ecosystems are iconic. They support enormous numbers of plants and animals that we can't find anywhere else in the world, and we are losing them. Rangelands in California are at the tip of the spear in terms of the conservation story.